Hi, welcome to our plasmid preparation lab, plasmid extraction. Uh, in this lab, you guys will be taking these tubes that contain some bacteria, and you will be extracting plasmids from them. Okay. Now, we have two tubes, which should make it easier for you guys to just balance things. So you're going to have something that you will be easily work with, two samples. Uh, and you'll be able to centrifuge them together, so you don't have to worry about waiting for somebody else to have a sample ready to go with you. Okay. Now, before we get started, I have printed off and read through my protocol. I have also used that protocol to make myself a flowchart so that I have a step-by-step -step, step instruction of what I'll be doing next. I recommend having a flowchart ready with you because this contains an explanation of why you're doing different steps. Okay, and when you are actually doing this stuff, it doesn't really matter too much why you're doing it. You just want to know what the next step is, which is why having a flowchart, a single page sort of thing, is a much easier th way to do this. So I suggest you have a flowchart ready to go with you before you get started. So you can work on that uh, before coming to the lab. Okay? Now once you're in the lab, the thing you will have to do is check to see what solutions you have. And so you have solution A on ice. So we have an ice bucket with a whole bunch of solutions. So we have solution A in here. The solution C, solution B, it contains SDS, so that's going to be kept at room temperature. Uh, you don't want to put SDS uh, on ice because then it will precipitate out, and so you won't have SDS in solution. So solution B is staying at room temperature, and it should stay at room temperature. Okay? You also have your 100% ethanol in here and your 70% ethanol in here, as well as your 1XTE that's already been pre-mixed for you, so you don't have to do that, and your 1XTER, so that's the TE with the RNA's enzyme, okay? So those are ready for you uh, to go. You also have, this is solution D, okay? This is your phenochloroform solution. And so one thing I want you guys to notice about this solution is that there's a small interface right there. So on top what you have is a bit of water that helps to prevent evaporation. Down below is where you have the organic phase. And so when you are taking the phenol from this tube, make sure your pipette tip goes down below that initial aqueous phase, down into the organic phase to take out the organic phase. Okay, so please be aware of that when you are working with the phenol chloroform. So let's get started. So what we have, first of all, is your two epitubes containing bacteria. Those are already pre-measured for you. You just have to put them into the uh, to the centrifuge, so I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to place this in a centrifuge. Uh, please make sure that you are balancing your tubes. Okay, so you want to make sure that your tubes are going to be distributed evenly between the two sides of the rotor. So just so that I'm going to do this the hard way, I guess. I'm not going to do that fancy thing with this. So you can see here is we have our tubes set out in a rotor, and they are on opposite sides of each other. Okay, so I have five empty spaces on this side and five empty spaces on this side. So it's one of the reasons why I gave you an even number of tubes to work with is so that you can easily balance your tubes before you get started. So my centrifuge is currently set to the maximum speed and it is set to one minute. And that's what we're gonna be spinning for. So I'm going to close it up and we're gonna get started with the procedure. Okay. It's going to be a little loud, so excuse me for a moment. So our centrifuge is almost done, so we have a few seconds left on this timer. While I was waiting for it, what I did was I had prepared a micropipetter for myself, so I have a P200, okay, so it's a P200, so you can see that it's a P200. But upside down, it is. No, it isn't. P200, and it is set to 100 microliters. Okay, so it's set to 100 microliters. I will be using this to add the next solution. But before I do that, I need to remove my epi tubes, and I will be emptying them out into a waste beaker. So I have a waste beaker that I'm going to be using for bacterial waste. That's going to be a biohazardous waste container. Okay, and so I will be disposing of the liquid first. And once I have just the pellets, I am going to, and so we can see here, is down at the bottom right there, there's a white pellet. Everything else is a clear solution. That's the 
LB. Okay, so we're going to be removing the LB. Just pour it out. The pellet is stuck on there pretty tight, so go ahead and just pour. And I'm just going to shake it out. So don't be shy about it. You can shake it out. That pellet's not going anywhere. You can see here, the pellet is still there. And all the liquid has been removed. Okay, so I'll do that with the second one as well. Okay, so again, just open it up and dump it into my waste beaker. Again, don't be afraid to tap it out. Remove as much of the liquid as you can. Okay. And so what we're left with is really just the cells themselves. There's a little bit of liquid in there. You don't have to worry too much about removing every single little bit, okay? It's nice if you can, but in the interest of time, we're going to move on. So with a P200, I'm going to use yellow pipette tips. So I'm going to use the smaller pipette tips. I should have opened this box earlier. And tap it on. Pipette tips on that nice and tight. I'm going to take solution A. And I'm going to pipette 100 microliters into the first epi tube. I'm not touching anything with the micro better tip, so I can just use the same tip again. If you touched anything, get a new tip. Okay, but if you haven't, then just go ahead and use the same tip to pipette the same solution into both tubes. Now I can get rid of the tip. Okay, and so I now have two tubes that contain my solution and the pellets. And what I need to do is just break up the pellets. So I'm going to use a uh, excuse me, vortex, and I'm going to just use a high speed to just break up these solutions. Now, one way to do this is to make sure that when you are putting your epi tube in to the vortex, it's at an angle. So don't put it in like this. Put it at an angle about 45 degrees, and that tends to give you the best mixing action. And so what we have right now is a solution that is mostly resuspended. I still see a little bit of a pellet, so I will continue working with this one. And then I will resuspend the second one. So this one's done. Again, this shouldn't take a long time. As, as long as you are holding the tube at about a 45 degree angle inside the vortex, you get a nice cloudy solution pretty quickly. So you get a resuspended pellet very fast. Okay. Now that I have resuspended my, uh, my solutions, my cells, I'm going to go ahead and add 150 microliters, sorry, 200 microliters, never mind, 200 microliters of solution B. That's the one that's sitting at room temperature right now, containing SDS. So that's going to lyse our cells and denature our DNA. So one of the things that you will notice is at least hopefully what you will notice is that your solutions will become clear when you add this. So I'm going to hopefully let you see this. So again, we have a cloudy solution to start with, and this is going to help to lyse our cells. And so you can see that the solution is becoming clear after the addition of NaOH and SDS. And again, that's just because what we have here is cell lysis. And so those cells are no longer in place. They're no longer able to block light. Okay, so again, I will do the same thing with the other tube. Take 200 microliters of solution B and add it to the other tube. And again, mix it up. Now, I don't want to be too rough with my mixing right now, so I'm just inverting a few times gently because what we're doing is we are denaturing the genomic DNA. If we are too rough with this, if we were to take this and mix it with a vortex, we would probably break apart the genomic DNA into tiny little fragments, and then it will be impossible to separate our genomic DNA fragments from the plasmids. So we want to keep that genomic DNA intact. So now that we have this, we're going to place both of these tubes on ice for about five minutes. And while we're doing this, we're going to prepare for the next step. Okay, so it's been about five minutes on ice, and so the tubes have incubated, the cells have had enough time to lyse. We have denatured as much of our DNA as we could. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to add our solution C. And so that's going to be 150 microliters. So again, I'm going to be using a P200 for this. And I'm going to be adding 150 microliters of our solution C. Okay, this is going to neutralize the pH of our solution and it's going to allow for the renaturation of the genomic DNA as well as our plasmids. Now, again, uh, because plasmids are highly supercoiled and they're very small, uh, they will renature very quickly and they will remain in solution. Whereas the genomic DNA is going to struggle to, to get back into solution and to renature properly because it's so much larger. Um, and so it's going to precipitate out. And so I added the solution C. And one of the things you will notice immediately is that there's going to be a white precipitate showing up. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but there is white stuff showing up inside this tube right now. Okay, That's the genomic DNA. So we will be getting rid of that. That is long, along with uh, proteins and uh, the membranes. Okay, So I'm going to put this back in. I'm going to add the solution to the next tube as well. So again, solution C goes into both tubes. And again, you can see right away, as soon as you add it, you're going to see precipitate showing up. You're going to be seeing a lot of white stuff showing up in your tubes, OK? So after doing this, you're going to mix it up. So make sure that all of the that genomic DNA has come into contact with this neutralized solution, OK? So it doesn't need to be a lot, just a little bit is enough. And so we have these. Uh, sitting, uh, we're going to put them back on ice for about five minutes, and then we're going to spin them down for five minutes in the centrifuge. Okay. Okay, so we're ready to put things in the centrifuge. Uh, before you do that, though, please, please, please make sure that you don't have any ice on the outside of the tubes. So just wipe them down with a paper towel, just to remove any water and ice on the outside of the tubes before you put them into the centrifuge. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to spin our samples, and again, I'm going to balance our tubes. And one of the things that I try to do whenever I do any kind of centrifugation is I'm going to try to put the hinges down towards the outside in the rotor. So just to show you what I mean by that, let's try using this camera. OK, so I'm recording this using my laptop, so it's not easy to do. So this, this is the hinge over here. So I'm going to put it into the centrifuge, into the rotor in a way that the hinge is pointing to the outside. And on this one, the same thing's happening, the hinge is on the outside of the rotor. Okay? What that's going to help me do is later on, if you do this as a habit, you're going to always know where to look for your pellet, because the pellet is always going to be on the same side as the hinges. Okay? So that's a tip from a molecular biologist to the rest of you. Always know where your hinges are. This, or at least always stick your hinges out to the outside so that you always know where to look for your pellet. So I'm going to lock this up and I'm going to spin this for five minutes and we'll see you in five minutes. Okay, we're back and our centrifugation is finished. So I'm going to take out my samples out of the centrifuge and we're going to see is that we have a whole bunch of the pellet along the edges exactly where my hinge is. Okay. Now in this case here it doesn't really matter uh, because we're not looking for this pellet, we're not trying to, sell, to collect this pellet. But again, if you have um, later on this, in this procedure you're going to be collecting DNA and it's going to be a very, very small amount. If you know that you always have the hinges out to the, towards the outside, you will always know where to look for your pellet. Okay? So you can see very clearly here that it always collects on the side that's towards the outside of the centrifuge rotor. Okay? And so if you put the uh, the hinge of the epi tube towards the outside, you will always know where to look for your pellet. Now, we don't really want to collect this pellet. We actually want to collect the supernatant from this. So we're going to be collecting the liquid. And we're going to be transferring that into fresh tubes. So during the break, I was actually labeling my tubes. And I have fresh tubes ready to go. So I'm going to just transfer 400 microliters of this liquid into the new tube. At least I will try to transfer 400 microliters. We'll see how well that works. Uh, usually it does fairly well. Now try not to pick up any of the pellet. So again, I have a P1000 this time. So you will see there's a P1000. It's got a blue label on it. Okay. Uh, so I've got blue tips on the end of that one. 
Okay, they are co color coded. And I'm going to just go to the first stop and then I'm going to put the tip into the epitube and I'm going to start pipetting out just underneath the surface of the liquid. So hopefully you can see where my tip is in this case, sort of. And as I take up the liquid, I'm going to go a little bit deeper with the tip so that I can continue taking out the 400 microliters. So I have 400 in here now. The remainder of this, I'm not going to get greedy. I'm going to leave it behind, OK? So again, the, you, the trick is to make sure that you're only taking up what you need. And you don't need all of it. You have more than enough DNA in here. So just collect what you can without contaminating with the, the pellet. So I have one epitube that's ready to go for the next step. And I'm going to collect the next one. And again, just really quickly remove, oops, wrong one. Remove the liquid without taking up any of the solids. Again, all the white stuff that you saw there, that's all that genomic DNA, the proteins, and the membranes of the bacterial cells. Okay, and so what we have in the liquid is the RNA and DNA, potentially still some protein left over, but mostly just the molecules we're interested in. So mostly just protein, sorry, mostly just DNA and RNA. So we have a visitor. I'm just recording a video. OK, so now what I need to do is I need to, to take my aqueous phase. And I'm going to add some organic solvent to this. So the phenol chloroform solution, that's in solution D that I pointed out earlier. So that's this stuff in here. Again, remember, we have two layers in here. So I'm going to have to get the tip below that upper layer of aqueous solution. I'm going to take the organic layer. Okay. So I'm going to take 400 of that. So we're going to put an equal volume. So one of the reasons I set out a volume of 400 is so that I could just say, OK, take up 400 microliters of the organic phase or the organic solution and add that to your solution. Now I've got to work quickly. Oh, it's dripping already. I have my tubes open, so I don't have to wait to transfer these. Okay? And so these tips, these are phenol contaminated. They go into the organic waste containers. So I have a beaker on here for organic waste. I'm going to place this tip in here. So anything that has phenol in it is going to go into that beaker. It's going to be disposed of properly. Okay. So again, I'm going to do the other tube now, trying to work a little bit quicker this time around, maybe. And I'm going to, again, go down below. Now, you might have seen me do this. So I'm going to try it again just to show you. I'm actually not going to the first stop right now. I'm actually going to blow bubbles as I go through. This way, I expel any of that aqueous phase that might be getting into my tip. So I'm blowing bubbles through this. And now I'm taking my organic phase. So I make sure that only the organic phase goes into my tip. And again, that's going to go into my epitube. The waste tip goes into the appropriate container. This gets put away as well. Okay. Again, phenol is nasty stuff, so please be very, very careful with it. I'm going to seal these tip tops very tightly, so I'm going to make sure that they are tightly capped. And so we have two layers inside these tubes. We have the organic phase and the aqueous phase. The aqueous phase is on top, the organic phase is in the bottom. I'm going to shake these up now. So basically what I want to do is I want to make sure that any proteins that might still be in that aqueous phase are going to come into contact with the uh, organic phase. And so mo a lot of the proteins will stay dissolved in the organic phase. And so in this way, we can actually remove most of the proteins that might be contaminating our sample still. Okay, So you can shake it just in your hand. You don't have to use a vortex. Some people like to use a vortex, but you can see even after shaking it, it's pretty cloudy because that organic phase and the aqueous phase have mixed fairly well. Okay, And so what you have to do now is just basically let them separate. You can either wait for you know, 20 minutes, half an hour for this to do naturally, or you can just put it into centrifuge. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to just spin it down for about one minute. Okay, and we're going to do it at maximum speed. So I'm going to just put in the centrifuge again, make sure that they are uh, balanced, and I'm going to run it for one minute in the centrifuge. Okay, so we're done with the centrifugation. Um, at some point, you might have noticed that I started wearing gloves in this procedure, uh, and that is because of what we were just doing. Uh, uh, basically, the phenol chloroform solution is very corrosive. If it gets on your skin, it is going to hurt. Okay, and it's going to be one of those cases where you're going to have to run over to the sink, 
and put your hand under the water, under running water, for a good 10, 15 minutes, and keep rubbing it off until you know it's been mostly removed. Okay, so uh, this is why you want to be wearing gloves for this part of the protocol. Okay, uh, so I have been wearing gloves for the past little while because I've been trying to protect myself from what's inside the tube. Okay. After the next few steps, though, I will be wearing gloves in order to protect what's inside the tube from me. Okay, so I will continue wearing gloves for the rest of the procedure just to make sure that what we have in the tube does not get contaminated with whatever enzymes I might have on my skin. Okay, so there's do, two different reasons to wear gloves. One is to protect yourself from what's inside the tube, but also you could be wearing gloves to protect what's inside the tube from you. Okay, so let's take out our samples. Now these have been spinning down to separate the aqueous phase from the organic phase and they were spinning at an angle and so I'm taking it out and I'm going to try to leave it at the same angle so I don't disturb the solutions from their current position. Okay? And I'm going to try to remove the aqueous phase which is the top layer. I'm going to try to remove as much of it as I can. Now again, I put in 400 microliters so in theory I should be able to take 400 out but I don't want to get greedy. I don't want to take up any of the organic phase. And so in order to make sure that doesn't happen, I am going to actually take less. So I'm going to take 350 microliters of the solution from here instead of the 400 that I actually put in here. And again, don't get greedy. There's more than enough DNA in there. You will still have a sizable DNA pellet at the end. Okay, so don't worry about losing stuff. Uh, you will have more than enough DNA in here. So let me just put this down. I'm actually going to take a P200 and I'm going to use a P200 instead of a P1000 just to make sure that I'm able to take up the small amount that I need without disturbing the, uh, the bottom layer. Okay? And the reason I'm doing that is because the tips for the P200 are thinner and so you're able to actually uh, take materials up more easily without disturbing that bottom layer. Okay? So I'm going to take the yellow tips for this, I have set my P200 to, I'm going to set it to 200 microliters, and then I will change the volume to 150 after that. So I will take out this epitube here. I already have fresh epitubes ready in my epitube rack, so my epitubes are ready to go. I just need to remove the aqueous layer, aqueous phase. So I will do that as carefully as I can and transfer this into my tube A. I'm going to change this to 150. Oops, get a new tip. Okay, and again, take up the remaining 150. So now I have 350 microliters of aqueous phase removed from here. I still have a little bit of aqueous phase left, but you can see it's just a small droplet at this point. And again, trying to remove that would risk me taking up organic phase, which is why I set a lower volume than 400. Okay? So this can go into the phenol chloroform waste. That's going to be the organic waste beaker. And so I have one of my tubes ready to go. I'll do the same thing with the other one. So again, I will just set it to 175. This way I can just do the same volume both times. And again, just open it up and take out what you need. I'm taking it from the top because that's where most of my aqueous phase is. So I'm trying to keep my tip as far away from the phenol as possible. and just underneath the surface of the liquid, okay? And again, we have a little bit of aqueous phase, but the rest of it is phenol chloroform, so we're gonna throw that into our waste container. Same goes for the tips. The tips also go into the waste container, okay, just to be on the safe side. Okay, so now I have my two epi tubes that contain um, 350 microliters of the aqueous phase that contains DNA and RNA and if there's any protein left there's very little at this point so we're going to be precipitating our DNA and RNA at this point. We do that by adding ethanol.
okay? And so we're doing that by adding two volumes of ethanol, so twice as much as what you put in. So it's useful to know the volume that you have in here, that's 350, so that I know how much more of the ethanol I need to add. And so I need to add about 750 mi 700 microliters of ethanol. So that's what I will do right now. I will set my P1000 this time to 700 microliters. And I will add 100% ethanol into this. So I'm going to add that to both of my epi tubes. That's going to be getting very close to the top of the epi tube. So you're going to get very close to the limit of what this epi tube can hold. Just keep that in mind. But don't be afraid. You should be able to fairly easily squeeze in 1.5 mils. So putting in an extra 700 microliters shouldn't be a problem. You can just have just a little bit over one mil in here. Okay. So I have now added my uh, ethanol. So the concentration of ethanol inside of these epi tubes is close to about 70% right now. Okay. So what we have in here now is our aqueous phase plus ethanol. And so what we're going to do now is just basically mix them. So just invert a couple of times gently and just leave them at room temperature for a couple of minutes. Okay. And then after that, we're going to spin these solutions down to precipitate all of our DNA. Okay. Again, the DNA that we're precipitating is going to be uh, plasmid DNA because you've already lost all of your genomic DNA. Your genomic DNA was removed in the very first tube after your first centrifugation. So, um, well, after the first centrifugation, um, after you've collected your bacteria, okay? So uh, we've already removed all the genomic DNA. All the DNA that's left over in there is just the plasmid DNA, and also there will be some RNA in there as well. Those are small molecules that can remain in solution fairly easily. Um, we're going to be removing those molecules in one of our tubes. Uh, we're going to have two solutions of TE that we're using at the end of the lab. One of them is TRIS-EDTA, or TE. The other one is TER, so that's going to be TRIS-EDTA plus RNAs, which is the enzyme that's going to break down RNA. And so what you have, will have in the end are two samples of plasmids. One of them will not have had any RNA removed, and one of them will. And so when we run them on a gel, you actually will be able to see the difference between those two samples uh, after the electrophoresis. Okay? So let's give it a couple more minutes. I'll come back in a minute or so. Okay, so we're done with our incubation. We're going to place our samples into the centrifuge for five minutes, and we're going to try to collect all of our DNA from these samples. Okay, so again, when you put them into the centrifuge, make sure that they are balanced, balanced configuration. And in this case especially, I would recommend that you make sure that your hinges of your epitubes are facing outwards. This way you know where to look for the pellets. Uh, please remember what we're doing here is molecular biology which means we're dealing with molecules. So we're expecting very, very tiny things in the end. So you may not be able to see your pellet very clearly, or if you do, it's going to be very, very small. Okay, so please make sure that you are uh, having an idea of where to expect to see your pellet. Okay, so I'm going to uh, get this thing locked into place, and I'm going to get the centrifuge started, and we'll see you in about five minutes. Hi, so we're done with our centrifugation at this point, and we should have a DNA pellet at the bottom of our epi tubes. Again, if you have had your hinges pointing outwards in the rotor, you will know exactly where to look for this, uh, for this pellet. So let's take out our samples and take a look. Okay, so right now they are sitting in the supernatant, and there's a small pellet. I don't know if you guys can see this, but there's a very small pellet right there at the very bottom here. Okay, so I will remove the liquid. Okay, that can go into the biohazard waste again. So I'm just going to pour it out. You don't have to be too careful. That pellet is stuck on there pretty tight. After spinning at 15,000 RPM for five minutes, it's not going anywhere. Okay, so shake it out well, tap it out. Okay, uh, in fact, what you can do is take a paper towel, put it on your bench and just tap it out over the paper towel to collect any excess liquid. Okay, so we can get rid of the excess liquid from the paper towel on the paper towel. And so what you have is a relatively dry tube that has very little liquid or minimal or almost no liquid. And now if you look carefully, even hopefully, see that there is in fact a small white pellet at the very bottom of this tube right there. 
Okay, so there's a small pellet right there. Again, why is it so small? Because it's molecular biology. We're dealing with molecules. The fact that you're seeing anything at all means you have a large pellet. So don't let the size of the pellet fool you. There's a lot of DNA in here. Okay? Let's do the same thing with the other one. We'll take it out. Again, don't expect to see a huge thing, but there is a small pellet at the very bottom where the hinge is. So right around here is where you will have a tiny little white pellet visible. And the only reason you can see it is because there's still impurities in there. So you still have some salts dissolved in that pellet, which is why you can see it. That's why it's white. Uh, DNA itself, when it's pure, is clear. So you wouldn't see it even if, you could, if it was there. At least you wouldn't see it easily. You still could. So again, I'm going to tap it out. Again, I'm going to use a paper towel and tap out the excess liquid so I can see the pellet a little bit more clearly. And again, it's right there. I don't know how well you guys can see this, but there is, in fact, a pellet. I really am not pretending or making this up. Oh, I think you might actually be able to see it now at this angle. Okay, so there's a pellet there. We're going to wash it with some ethanol. So we're going to add a milliliter of 70% ethanol to this. Now, depending on the protocol, you might see people doing the wash two or three times. We're just going to do it once. Just add one milliliter. The actual volume doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. Okay, so you could use a half a milliliter if you want. You just add a milliliter of ethanol, 70% ethanol to each of the tubes. Okay. Make sure you're pipetting accurately so that you have the tubes balanced at the end. Okay. And close the tubes. Do not do not try to resuspend the pellet. If you do, it will never stick back to the side of the tube again. Okay, so leave the pellets where they are. You just added some ethanol. Put these back into the centrifuge. Oops. This is what happens in labs. Spills happen. So I have a little bit of uh, biohazardous material on the bench. I'll clean that up while I'm spinning the stuff down. So I'm going to spin for about one minute. Okay, so I'll see you guys in one minute. Okay, so we're back. The spin is done. The spill is cleaned up. Uh, it was just a matter of wiping it up with some paper towels and wiping it down with some ethanol afterwards or disinfectant. Um, disinfectant, okay? So um, once the spill is cleaned up and we have our tubes ready to go, uh, I just need to remove the ethanol. Now, you don't want to leave the tubes, uh, your pellets in the ethanol for too long. Again, it's a wash step, so you're actually trying to clean this thing up a little bit. Uh, and what we're doing actually is we're trying to remove any more of those salts that might be dissolved in that pellet. So uh, that pellet might become a little bit less visible. Uh, you also want to be a little bit more careful because the pellet might have become a little bit more loose at this point. It might have moved. So um, again, you're still trying to remove as much ethanol fr from this as possible. So we're inverting the tube over a paper towel, tapping it out. But just touch, tap it gently because in this case, at least here, the pellet has actually moved over. So it has become loose and it's on the side of the tube here. That's the pellet, it's still visible, uh, but we want to remove as much liquid as possible because if you have any ethanol still left in your pellet before you dissolve it in TE, that's going to potentially interfere with enzymatic reactions. It's going to affect your final product in the end. So make sure that you have a dry pellet. So what we, do, what we tend to do is leave this pellet to air dry, okay? So you can leave it either in a fume hood with a sash down so that there's air passing over the surface for about 10 minutes or so to remove any excess ethanol or you can just leave it on your bench in front of you, upside down so nothing falls in, okay? So you can just kind of leave this in a kind of a clamshell sort of configuration, so we can see that here. Just leave it sitting on your bench like this for about 10 minutes or so. The air is gonna be passing by it, and as it's doing that, it's gonna be removing the ethanol. After about 10 minutes, what you do is you sniff the tube. If you don't smell any ethanol, then it's probably dry. Again, look for any droplets of ethanol along the sides, which is why, again, we're doing this initial step where we're just tapping out the liquid. So we remove as much of the actual liquid from here as possible. And also remember that 70% ethanol means 30% water, okay? So if you don't smell any ethanol, but there's still some droplets in here, it's probably water at that point. So it's probably not going to be a problem. Ethanol evaporates fairly easily. It's very volatile. So after about 10 minutes, most of it should be gone from here. So again, after 10 minutes, Smell it. Don't do the chemistry thing. This will not do anything for you. So smell it. Don't cough into it. Don't breathe into it. You don't want to be adding enzymes to this. Just sniff it. If it doesn't smell like ethanol, it's dry. You can go ahead and do the next step, which is adding TE or TER. Okay? 
So I'm going to do this with the other one, and then we're done. So about 10 minute incubation, um, just to dry it out. Then you're going to add the TE or TER, that's the final solution on which your sample will be stored, and you're finished. The sample with the TER, with the RNAs, is going to be also incubated for 30 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius, just to allow the RNAs to do its job okay, before we store it. But again, once you have added the, the solutions to your samples, to your um, pellets, they will dissolve fairly easily. Okay? And at that point, just leave the samples on your bench. We will collect them and we will place them into the appropriate places as necessary. So please just indicate to us on the tube which one has TE and which one has TER. This way we know which one we need to incubate for you for the 30 minutes. And then we will store the samples for you until next week. Okay? Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the lab.